Well, thank you for letting me be today's last speaker. They say that uh, people forget 80% of what they're told during the day. And I guess right now 80% of you are too tired to check anymore in. So this leaves me with a pretty bad starting point. Pretty challenging. But I'm trying to be very kind to you. Um, I attended this conference two years ago. And I heard all these humanistic students sitting there crying, oh my god, I can never get a job. No one will ever believe that there's any value in my education to doing business. Oh my god, I'm totally fucked up. <laughs> and I was extremely provoked about this lack of confidence. And I think this lack of confidence is the biggest issue of humanities, not the humanities and education in themselves. And I want to be pretty confident in this talk, and even so confident that I'm saying to you that humanities can be seen as the ultimate education for a young entrepreneur. And I'm doing this very personally. I'm not standing here for all the cool faculties of uh, humanities. And it is pretty personal. You see this park high pool thing. It's about me swimming half naked in a pool in Tokyo. Um, but if you cannot take any more in, I just ask you to take this picture end of me sitting in this uh, bed at the Park Hyatt Hotel. And what I did was I was inspired by my favorite movie character, and actually I just, through my humanity uh, studies, I had enough money to actually go there, and this picture is just for you to see that things can be real, all the fiction we have in humanities can go to the other part over the gap and turn into something real. So this picture, if that's enough for you, just take them and leave. But the picture I would prefer you to, to remember is, is this picture. Because this is a personal talk. This is an inspirational talk, so it has to be personal to be inspiring. Um, so I sat down, what do I think about when I think myself as this humanist doing business? And I saw myself in this pool on top of the world. Um, you have these amazing skyscrapers. If you walk through this window, you look down at all these skyscrapers, and it's like, wow, what the fuck? We can do so much. This is what humans are capable of doing, artistically and Engineeringly, it's the first thing we'll show aliens coming to Earth. Wow, we can actually do something as humans. And all this atmosphere is some kind added to this pool and me being in this pool. And it's, wow, we can do stuff, we can do stuff. And this is, then I have all these ideas and pictures in my head. Stuff, I will come back to that later. And I hope you can understand just a little part of it. But first, the background for me, uh, what have I done in life, practically, not that personally. Um, I went from a school like this and went to uh, the humanistic bunker, uh, where it's definitely cooler to state that Foucault is gay than wearing a tie. And uh, I was, I am holding a bachelor degree in, in uh, comparative literature. But actually, I'm not done yet. I'm still one of you. After nine years of studies, I'm still to finish my thesis in the modern culture at Copenhagen University. So I'm still one of you. Not just this stranger that was there another time when the financial crisis wasn't there, stuff like that. Um, so this is, I don't know if I'm proud of this web page, but I made it when I was 14 years old, and I always had all these ideas, I want to do stuff. And I made this, it was very original, I called it my own name. I think it was so cool. And I started uh, advising all these dark traders. And it was just so easy because everything just went up. Whatever I said, they told me I was a genius. Um, and along the line, I did a lot of stuff online. I did uh, literary magazines. I've done something with travel. I've even done something with condoms. Done all these crazy ideas. And ending up in this weird thing called Carlo Mansion, where I took all this popularity of expected programs on the internet, and putting on to a format online where you take all, out all the crap and you have this thing not being YouTube. 
and it was um, pretty popular, but I grew a little tired of this because I didn't change the world by, by making this fake, fictive mansion with some people singing pretty cool. Um, so I was still online, I saw this TED talk with the MIT professor Neil Gershenfeld, and he talked about, he had this vision that we in 10 years will all have personal production at home. This meaning we'll have this kind of 3D printer where we do not go down to a shop to buy a new car. We buy the design online and then we print it at home. And even going maybe 10 years more ahead of time, you can just take your old cup at home, put it down to this printer, and there you have it. Local production, it's self-sufficient local production for your local needs. And it's, you just end there, there's no, in this vision, there's no more this, you buy a shoe that fits pretty good for 10 million different people, one size, now it's, it's done. You have all these things fitting exactly your needs. Um, and Neil Gershenfeld invented this concept called Fab Labs, where you check these digital machines these things where everything you can think of, you can make. That's the idea. So you go into this, this uh, computer, if you can draw it, it will just print it right away. Or you have this vision, this was a very ugly version of the house. We did uh, the first draft. Um, you can go from that to that through this machine. You can go from this to this. With this machine, it's so easy. You do the same thing. And I saw a great it was a great vision. You're turning, it's an industrial revolution, you're turning everything upside down. Uh, the economies will completely change. And especially as the humanist, I, I saw this, we have this new world and we just have to have ideas and then we have engineers, they like just the software. Um, and all the creative industries will be all about them and then the people studying law because now we start to copy, like, not just the use of, we start copying everything. Um, but I was really intrigued by this Fab Lab, and the analogy to explain the Fab Lab is that you had these net cafes, very weird places in the, in the 90s. And what these net cafes has been for the personal computer use that everyone knows today, that is this Fab Lab for the personal production just 10 years ahead. And I was extremely intrigued by this, and I, and I found out that you had all these fab labs, these laboratories that you can go to and do this stuff around the world, but not in Denmark. And come on, why not? Why do you not have this? It's so natural that this is the next step. So I went around the world to uh, get the best practice. And I don't have the time to tell you about these pretty cool projects that I just realized a few minutes ago. But I went to Spain, North Norway, on a small island, had salmon three times a day, um, Manchester, sorry, it's going so fast, and finally <coughs> ended up at MIT and actually meeting this guy I saw. Again, something fictional, not that fictional, but it's online, and then I'm sitting with the man himself. Uh, and tried to do this shot, but I was really noticing. Um, <laughs> and right now, today, people just, they saw the logic in this. So today, the first Fab Lab in Denmark is a reality, and many more are popping up. But it was not enough for me just to take this concept to Denmark. I fitted it for the Danish needs, but it was not enough. I want to do more, I want to have this, ooh, weird, cool one to this network. Um, so I said, let's be the first ever to make a fab lab with a fab lab. This meaning that we'd, we would only we'll make the building itself the fab lab solely with fab lab equipment. So that's what we did. And of course I took inspiration in this project. And going down, this was made in the fab lab Barcelona. And then I met with a guy who had been around people doing this, and I teamed up with him. And of course people could see you done this, you have the guy, you have some visions. Okay, let's do it. So the money for this was, there was no, no limits. 
So we wanted to do it, one of the key points of this new digital fabrication is the form is free. Because the same if you make squares as if you make crazy form. So we had to show off. We had to go crazy, crazy, crazy. And along the line, you might have forgotten some aesthetics. But, but this is the key concept that you, you, you make this in your computer and you unroll it all to all these pieces. And you put it, this information, these pieces, digitally into this machine. And then you have all the parts, physically. And through our own billing system, we started doing this. And at one time, I was responsible, I was the project manager for this as well. I was responsible for 50 people. And we had no real organization structure because it was just so fast. People saw this vision, they came from Chile, they came from, from Spain, they came even from, from Serbia. Um, people also came from Greece, but that was because they definitely could not get a job down there. Um, yeah, so we just made the house. And then the fab lab moved in. And thanks for us having this ground. This is the easiest thing is to do business is if you have a brand new idea, everyone can see this is something. Um, and then we should just have made this small pavilion that should have been there for three years. But then we made this huge building that's going to be there for 30 years. And we, along the line, we had a half million uh, kroners and sponsorship. Just people want to take part of this. Um, and even the Queen wanted to take part of this. And uh, I have to say, I had, I had 20 minutes with the Queen. And we, um, yeah, we, uh, it's just a funny detail. We did not have a chair for her. We only had the cheapest chair you can ever buy, this IKEA chair for 39 kroners. But she was pretty satisfied just sitting down. And I discussed with her, I said, oh, all these organic lines, can you see it? it's the future? And just, she just told me, it was just like, I want straight lines. <laughs> and it was like, I could not, I, could, I was not even allowed to ask the Queen any questions. So I couldn't really, we had a little debate, but it was very, very polite. Um, <clears throat> we did the Fab House, and all this vision about people <coughs> in Denmark now being able to come in and realize their ideas. The gap between idea and product is just gone with this technology. But I wanted to do something, maybe something even more, wow, I really, this is not just about people coming and making key hangers for their friends. I wanted to do something where it was a real instant need. So I went to Japan and um, to see what I could do in order for all this tsunami uh, catastrophe. Um, and first I went to this temporary house in a large city. But then I discovered this island that many people have abandoned because all these people that are here, they lived from the fishing industry. Um, so now all the jobs are gone. And I went out on a bike, and you see all this destruction. And a few people still live there, but it's only short term because there's nothing to do. But I saw this sawmill. This, was, this is the one thing they had. And have the idea before we have it had in your front yard of fish or the sea industry. And why don't you look back? You have all this all these resources in your backyard, all the wood on this peninsula. And the main thing is people could not live out here if there's no job locally. So the idea was to take this CNC machine into the sawmill and then create something new. Um, and actually, it's a pretty nice uh, coastline. And this is not something we've done because this project is not done yet. But this is like a reference, inspiration for what we are aiming to do. We're going to make a pavilion 100% out of Oshika wood. And then it's going to be spectacular and better looking than the fat house. Um, and then people, we're going to do it in sessions. And architects, together with the locals who create small objects, they can be sold in the pavilion and they can also be sold online. And I'm not expecting the locals to be designers. It could be very cool if they were. But at least this is going to be, they can sell it, they can have a job selling these items and not at least producing them. So this is the way of creating new kind of businesses 
from local means, 100% local, self-sufficient means, and check all this, Becky, all this, all this amazing stuff. This is an art piece from an it used to be an abandoned island in the Japanese Inland Sea, but then they turned it into an art island. And wow, everybody came, and we could expect the same with this pavilion. But doing all these non-profit um, projects, I'm also doing a hardcore business called uh, Combo Building Systems. And this is about the vision that in the future, everyone should be able to create their own uh, surroundings, shape their own surroundings. Today we just move into these square boxes that maybe some old lady just left. Um, and the aim is to make the world's most flexible and intelligent building system. And we're doing this, we're taking these robots that you all know from the car commercials, and then this is the same technology, and you have this very efficient car industry, and we're taking all this to the not so efficient building industry. Um, but short term, this is very business business. We're going to make a resort in China. We came, we went to China on market research, and we see that you have all these people moving into the mega cities. Now people actually want a little bit of this, not being all the pollution, uh, but being some more natural calm surroundings. So that's a short term thing we're going to do. Um, we actually just had one meeting showing a video about the Fab House with the investment fund, and they were pretty willing to offer uh, 12.5 million, uh, the half for our startup budget. Um, but I've just said no to this, because um, that would mean that we had to do the development in China, and I want to do it in Scandinavia for many reasons. So right now we're building houses, prototypes in Sweden, and then going to China, and then hopefully doing the long time version. But now, back to the fun stuff with this pool, and me in this pool. Um, just, yeah, just better go into this water um, and try to explain you what's it all about. Um, and I made these five basic swim strategies for humanists doing business. Uh, Maybe you'll understand in a few seconds. But when I think of business, I think of this as this very, very easy gra uh, graph for doing business. You have like something in your past. You have idea, you have experience. You have done this, maybe here, and then you have done this. And between these two lines is some kind of natural constant. There's some kind of development, and I call this the K, the constant. And if you do this and this, I can do that. So you show you can go boom, boom, boom. And business is always just about looking into the future and making it light, lightable, what you say. People can say, oh, yeah, 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 I see that, I see that. Um, and through strategies, you be a, you're able to convince people that this K is the same as that K. That's how I look at it all the time. It just has to be this some kind of profit when I walk into a room and talking to investors. Um, the first thing, getting ideas, this is a dive. This is where you go underwater and you look at things in new ways. Things are like very different underwater. And then we have this amazing guy. He's the Japanese inventor and he has made what he called the underwater invention method. He goes underwater and then he almost dies, he says. And then he gets this idea so instantly, right away. And um, here you see him with his notepad. <laughs> and he's amazing. And I'm not sure if it's true, but he says that he invented the floppy disk, the digital display, and at least karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> and in relation to the humanities, the thing about all the art that I'm dealing with with my study. Um, and this is from the Japanese art museum where you have this art installation. You actually only have 10 centimeters of water, but when people look down, things are real cool. And then I had this amazing photo of this Japanese man because he, he looked down and there was nothing. And then, oh, suddenly there was a man walking under the water with all his clothes on. He couldn't get it. And this shock, that's the shock of the new. And the more shocks of the new you can get, 
the more you extend your ability to get ideas. So when I need to have ideas, it's a pretty good thing I should go to uh, an art museum. And this is something I saw last week in Berlin. It's um, these ties sitting and talking about a French painting. And they, they just say things you have never, ever thought about. And the funny thing about this is every time now I go to an art gallery, I sense these ties be behind me and some kind of sense that they say something that I never heard about. And this is a pretty good back team to have uh, in order to get ideas. Then you have understanding the customs. That's the breast swimming. That's like, oh, you, you get it in, you understand it. Um, and somehow when I'm in a pool, I think if we try to have this vision room, it's me, and then I think of, I heard that like 100% of all the Olympic swimmers, they pee in the, in the pools. And so who peed in the pool is what I thought. And then I looked at this fragment from my bookshelf, and I combined Selim with the Bible, and then I thought about a quote that he has about uh, Jesus. Um, and this quote is, did Jesus go to the trial in front of everybody? It seems to me his racket wouldn't have lasted long if he'd taken a shit in public. Very little presence, that's the whole trick, especially in love. Um, and what I have to say is that it's all about the human experience. And now I'll have to state what, when I went out from this school, boarding school, high school. Like, the majority went to Copenhagen Business School, other business schools. Only one was a girl, she also went to the humanities. After half a year, she also went to Copenhagen Business School. But I would still say that I think it's the perfect choice for me in order to do business, to choose humanities. Because I was sitting there, what, what do I need to know to do business? I need to know the customer. And if you're not thinking about all the pets and stuff, most customers are people. So I have to understand humans. So I have to study humanities. That was like the logic I made. Um, and yes, you can go to a business school and you can learn all of this technical stuff. But I have to say that it's never been an issue for me to do this, to make a business plan. Honestly, I just Google it, I see examples of how you do it. But the main point is you cannot Google a Selim novel. You cannot just Google the Bible. And what's more important is I can I do not just read a Selim novel. I need some kind of guidance. And that's why it makes perfect sense for me to go to university where I have all this perfect guidance for understanding this human experience. This is the stealing strategy. This is the dark swimming where you have these pores taking stuff in. Um, and I was not that happy about taking this in, but this was what I'm thinking about in the pool when I think about stealing. I think about, this is from the Danish radio show, very famous called Tiskenhop, from the 90s, and they also made it to television. And here they are playing a game called uh, Troll, Panish Troll or something. And where they are throwing away their pants and then some listeners have to return them to the, to the studio and they will get a reward. And I think of this because the most popular comedian in Denmark, Kasper Christensen, he has used this stealing technique for every single project he made. Every single project. This Tesco Hall was completely inspired by American radio host Howard Stern. And if you just take this clock, it's, it's so much the same. You even have the same kind of process, even the jingle is the same. But I don't give a shit. Because Casper is still taking all these known things, but turning them into his own stuff. So no people say, ah, he's just a copycat. It's not working like that, he's stealing. And I will say that stealing is like the way of evolution. If you go through these books, they, you will see so many kinds of, of different yeah, kind of stealing. Um, just showing you what I thought about was when I watched Django Unchained. You have these adaptation references. 
all over. You even have, you even have an, you even have he's using this uh, Siegfried Brunhilde Wagner, that, and he's even taking a fake taken and turning it these old myth, mythical Germans into African Americans. You, you see it all over. And what I did myself, you can say I steal this and turn it into this. And this was this graph. I took, I took the solar house from Barcelona, and then I added it with a guy from down there who had the experience. And it made sense. If he could do something like that with them, he could do this other stuff with me. And then you have being understood. That's like a steady swim rhythm. This is where you have the composition in order. And you cannot, you cannot even sell a sausage if people cannot understand what is, is, it says in that, the package. Um, and in order to speak about composition, I think of this, this is just an easy joke um, that I tried water polo my horse round. It's a very, very short story, but everyone can see the point. Oh my god, a guy thought you had to take the horse to the water to do water polo and then the horse drowned? Ah, I see the point. And this, ah, this is the power of the point. And you have to use it everywhere you go. There's nothing stronger than people. I get it. I want to sell 10 tons of sausage because I've seen this kind of show where and then I heard a lot of art. And then the next, yeah, yeah, I see the point. It's all about this point. And you can be better at doing point and better at composing if you know the more better composed stories. And this, we live in this world where you have all this information coming in from everywhere. And it's, I will, I will say, you have this thing today, if some people write on their resume CVs that they have run 10 marathons. And it's like, yeah, he's a steady guy. I will say in the future, maybe, just in a half year. I'm, I've, never, I've never had a job, um, actually. Uh, I, remember, I remember writing to my dad. Um, I had my first in, uh, job interview today. I hired him right away. Um, but this is just, put it on your resume, your CV, that you, I have read uh, 10, 10 novels, about 300 pages, the last year. I'm kind of like, not this, I'm able to give you this anti-fragmentation. I'm able to have these long, coherent lines. Um, and yeah, learning all this from the stories. And this art piece from Beijing um, is an artist who's making this woodcut, and every time he loses his concentration, it goes a bit out. And I would say I'm not fond of straight lines, but in this, this particular case, I will give the queen uh, his right. The more straight you can keep your line, the more steady you can be in your way of composing and telling stuff, the better you can make money. I would say, it doesn't even matter what you actually do, if you can just give people coherence these days, it's, um, you can make money. And then we have the last strategy, is using analogies. This is the butterfly, I cannot do it without fucking up my shirt. Um, this is the beautiful thing. This is the, place where people will get emotionally uh, involved. And just a very easy analogy, I turned this graph into a non-peeing section and a peeing section, because you have this analogy when you have non-smoker and smoker section in a restaurant, it's like having a non-peeing section and a peeing section in a pool. Everyone can relate to having pee around them. Uh, <laughs> don't know where that came from. but. Um, <laughs> Another very, very strong analogy is this one, uh, made by Selim again. He says, if you're not working, if you're, you don't have a job, don't even have bad weather to complain about, it's like the water draws back and then reveals the truth. And it's shit, and it's smelly, it's horrible. And I'm not sure this analogy is true, but it's, oh, it's really getting to me. Is it true that I have no life uh, outside of work? It's, oh, I really get emotionally involved. And then I, have, I just had to do this because analogy is something that we all do, um, especially in school essays. So I just had some examples from the school essays, and it says, he was deeply in love when she spoke. She, he was deeply in love when she spoke. He, he thought he heard bells as if 
It was a garbage truck backing up. It's a very, very beautiful one. He was as tall as a 160 centimeters high tree. John and Mary had never met. They were like two hummingbirds who had also never met. We all know these analogies and we all want to do them and they are working very strong. And just in this fragment of my bookshelf, we have analogies all over. Thousands and thousands of analogies that you can learn from making analogies yourself. And just doing a combo, we are using this analogy with the robot you all know from the car commercials and we're taking it to the building industry. It's so easy. And then I have to say, of course, you can get all this human experience outside of the university. I was very close to drop out of the humanities. And I was just saying, fuck these five years. I can just climb the Mount Everest and I now will learn as much about being a human as I can do in five years of study. But I still have to say, especially as a young person, I'm only 27. Um, going to the humanities is it's really a shortcut to all this human experience. You even have the guidance along. You have this experience from all the times. It's just I think it's it's a pretty good deal. So back to this basic graph. Maybe you can sense some of this involvement. I turned into a new guy, a cute, curly swimmer, because that's what I, I could be in some kind of fantasy. Um, but then you have the ideas, you have the customer knowledge, you have these new, but new elements, and then you have a star with a strong paw, and you have a clear, simple analogy, and all this being just vision room. And what the vision room is, is when I walk into a room, talk to an investor, boom, 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 and then I walk out. What he's left with is the vision room. This is what he thinks and feels and sees when he thinks about this idea. And the better this vision room is, the better you're gonna, gonna make it. And it, this is your actual product. So going back to this pool now, I put it quite something into it. We have this crazy Japanese inventor. That's something about ideas. He's, he's down there. We have this smelly beach. Oh. These analogies really get to me. We have to drown, pull the holes, say something about you have to do strong. You can do strong analogies. We have this troll panties thing. And I tried to make this vision room because I guess in a half year, or maybe already tomorrow, you'll have forgotten most of what I've said. But the vision room I want to leave you with. Maybe some of these elements, maybe yourself, and swing around in this pool. But the main thing is that you have just to remember that at least one guy from a humanistic education had a very large confidence that the humanities was the perfect, perfect education for doing business. And that humanities definitely can be suitable for business. Thank you.